Cousin Sal's winning weekend, Bet for Bet, the greatest sports gambling show on television. And to prove it, coming up, we've got Pound for Pound, one of boxing's best of all time, here to help us get ready for the Mike Tyson-Jake Paul fight that's finally happening tonight. Roy Jones Jr. will be joining us. He's literally the last man to step into the ring with Mike Tyson and live to tell about it. Then we've got the light heavyweight parlay champion of the world, Darren the Parlay Kid Sicoli, will join me to break down the Week 11 NFL slate, including the battle for Texas. Texas on Monday night. Take it, Houston. It's all yours. But let's kick things off with perhaps our most dangerous segment. Yes, it's about to get crazy. It involves producer babyface Joel Solomon throwing a crumpled up piece of paper with a thought written on it. I'll catch it. I'll read it. And I'll tell you my thoughts on the issue. We call this Tossing Topic. Hit me, babyface. What's the first one? Good one. Not bad. Soto situation. All right. The big name in baseball free agency is Juan Soto. My first choice, of course, would be for him to sign with the Mets. My second choice would be for him to sign with anyone other than the New York Yankees. The Silver Slugger winner is set to meet with the Blue Jays and Red Sox, which makes sense. But there was another team that showed interest that reached out to Juan's agent, the Tampa Bay Rays. Juan Soto is projected to receive a nearly $700 million contract, and the Rays are pretending to be interested. Interested. This poor Tampa team, and I mean that both literally and figuratively, can't even afford to put a new roof on their stadium. Hal Steinbrenner sits up and more money pops up from his couch than the entire Rays payroll. And how does this meeting go anyway? Juan, you know, I know you love the lights of the big city, but Tampa once had Tom Brady and we've got a great cheesecake factory by the airport. It, it got four and a half stars on Yelp. You can check it out. Also, did you know that in 2013, Guinness recognized South Tampa's ceviche tapas bar and restaurant for preparing the world's largest pitcher of sangria? Yeah, seriously. Now, if you'll just sign right here, we'll try to get you a free commemorative glass. <laughs> Juan Soto is not going to Tampa, but the Rays can see him next year when they meet up with the Mets June 13th to 15th at City Field. Be sure to say hi. Toss me another one, babyface. That's a good one. Gronk jump. Oh, yeah. Did you see this? Fox NFL pregame last Sunday. Gronk jumped out of a helicopter and into the ocean. Here it is. He performed this stunt in honor of Veterans Day from the San Diego Naval Base. And as far as I'm concerned, the most impressive part is how close the pilot got to the ocean so that Gronk could carry out this very short drop into the drink. I mean, look at that. They could have tush pushed him the rest of the way. Footballs that Gronk spikes go a higher distance than that. And look. Gronk is part of the FanDuel family and could crush me with one of his gigantic pinky fingers. But with all the buildup, I kind of felt cheated. I mean, what's next? Howie Long rascaling around the Fox studio without a helmet? Kurt Menefee puts his head in a chihuahua's mouth? Terry Bradshaw walking in Crocs on lukewarm coals? These guys are nuts. Hey, Fox, you want to showcase a perilous exercise? Put Gronk in the broadcast booth alongside Tom Brady. If he could survive three hours of that, he could survive anything. Ratings gold. All right, one more, baby. Cowboys Stadium Sun. All right. By rule, I can't throw back a tossing topic, so here we go. You know, they say the sun shines on a dog's ass every now and then. I think that came from the new Secretary of Poetry, Dr. Phil. Anyway, for the Cowboys, it was last Sunday, specifically around 5 p.m. Eastern, because as the sun was setting on Dallas Cowboys season, it was also setting directly into their stadium. I mean, look at this blazing inferno. It looks like a meteor was about to hit the field, and frankly, I wish it did. All-pro wide receiver Can't C.D. Lamb dropped an easy touchdown, and it wasn't just him. On this week's injury report, kicker Brandon Aubrey is day-to-day -day with second-degree burns. After the game, Jerry Jones was asked about fixing the stadium, and he didn't love that. It has been an advantage for us to know where the sun is. I don't want to change that. I got news for you. Jerry isn't fixing the roster. He's not fixing the stadium. Jerry Jones basically built a billion dollar tanning salon. The stadium sponsor should be Banana Boat. The Cowboys can't block a three man rush. How are we expected to block the heart of our solar system? Mike McCarthy is the only NFL head coach whose hot seat has been affected by global warming. You know what? It actually gives me hope. At this point, I'm just rooting for a permanent solar eclipse so I can get my Cowboys over nine and a half win ticket voided on a technicality. Yuck. All right, that does it for Tossing Topics. Now it's time for my irrationally angry attempt to make rational sense of a somewhat irrational bet. It's wagering. <laughs> More Cowboys talk. My beloved Dallas derelicts are three and six entering week 11 with, let's face it, lots of blowouts left on the schedule. And while I wish, like Dak Prescott, I could be done for the season, 
I'm a glutton for pasta and punishment. Talk about a cousin's conundrum. I have to watch, so let's make some money off these cow bozos. Or more accurately, on their opponents. We're taking the Houston Texans at an adjusted minus 14 and a half points. Pays plus 230 on FanDuel Sportsbook. And before you say, whoa, Sal's betting against his own team. Someone lead him to the medical tent. Just know. I'm only basing this on the fact that we can coach, throw, tackle, run for first down, stay healthy, get along, block out the sun, elicit joy, make sense during unnecessary weekly interviews. But besides that, we're dynamite. Our MVP is our kicker, and even he is only good for 12 points a game. The Texans should bounce back this week and score 30-plus. And while I'm taking Houston this week, don't worry, Cowboys fans. Our future is bright at least until Jerry fixes the sun blasting through our stadium. Now let's get to my interview with boxing Hall of Famer Roy Jones Jr. All right, our next guest is one of the few boxers who could say he walked to the ring singing his very own song. I think Clubber Lang did it once very early in his career. He's a member of the International Boxing Hall of Fame and now part of the All the Smoke team and will be a ringside analyst for this Friday's big Mike Tyson-Jake Paul fight on Netflix. Pound for pound and punch for punch, one of the all-time greats, Roy Jones Jr. What's happening, Roy? Doing good, brother. How you doing? Good. Thanks for being here. Let's get right to this fight. And then I want to go over your career, which is uh, just stellar. But I went from with this Paul Tyson fight, I went from not watching the fight. No way I'm going to watch to, OK, I'm interested uh, to I'm going to have to bet hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on this fight. What were your thoughts when you first heard about the matchup? And has that changed over the last few months for you? Uh, no, my thoughts were I knew the fight was coming one day. This was a matter of time. Um, I thought it was a good fight to see. I knew that Jake was doing a great thing for generating money via social media for boxing period. And I was glad that somebody like Mike Tyson uh, was giving myself hope because we are over 50 and we make make the kind of money that they make and steal at that age. It's crazy. So I thought it was a beautiful idea to start with. Second was, I wasn't sure how, how serious Mike was going to take the fight. I know if Mike don't take it serious, Jake could have a chance. But if Mike takes it serious, he don't have a chance, in my opinion. If Mike is sensible and boxes Jake Paul, Jake has a chance. If Mike gets pissed off to, to the old Mike and comes out and just goes ham, nah, Jake couldn't beat Mike. Wow. Even so I wanted, to, I wanted to have you on for, for many reasons, but specifically because you were the last man to step in the ring with Iron Mike. You mentioned it. It was an exhibition fight in 2020. The fight was a draw. Was there anything you learned in that fight that surprised you being in the ring with Mike Tyson? Yes, I learned that, first of all, he still punches just as hard as he punched back in his heyday. That's a known fact. Number two, Mike Tyson is not as easy to hit as people think he is. Now, him and Jake trading, anything can happen. Yes, because Jake, Jake is definitely a strong puncher, but Mike is not no guy that you just can go out there and hit him how you want to when you get ready. It's the reason Mike was the youngest heavyweight champion of all times. Yeah. Now, did you feel like, be honest, you know, they're not going to take the money away from you. Did you feel like either of you held back at all in that fight? Well, they, in our fight, because it was an exhibition in California under all the sanctioning rules, they told us that if we see you guys throwing haymakers to the head, we're going to stop the fight. Oh, really? Because oh. They told us, they told us, they did say, we're not letting y'all fight a real fight. Y'all are both above 50. You know, so y'all can do all y'all want to the body. And y'all can hit to the head, but if we see y'all trying to take to the head off, we're not we're gonna stop the fight. And so, I mean, he hit me a couple of times. That still, I thought it could have been worth of stopping the fight, but I didn't want the fight to stop. I want to continue going because I hit him with a few too. And after after one of them, I think um, after the fight, that was a damn good hook. I know because he hit me with a good right hand, then he ripped the belt my nose which is yeah. illegal, but he did it. So I was like, okay, <laughs> but that's Mike. Mike going to be Mike no matter what. So I knew no matter what they tell him, he going to do what he want to do, and which is what he did. So it was cool. I understood it, but Mike Mike, Mike is Mike. And um, you know, if, if we don't out there with intention, they said we, we see y'all trying to knock each other out completely without boxing, we're going to stop. And they did tell us that. So we couldn't go out there and go all out like we wanted to, but we did go all out enough that we understood what we were dealing with. You understand me? So you put on a nice show for sure. That's interesting. I never knew that. Now, one difference there was between your fight, even though it was an exhibition, and this one is I believe you wore 12 ounce gloves in the fight against Tyson. Yeah, These are I 14 we'll, for this Friday, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah, but it won't make a difference because it even won't. though was, the first time he hit me in the chest, it felt like a horse had kicked me in my chest. And that was 12 <laughs> ounce blood. 14 ain't gonna be much different either. So 
I still feel like no matter what ounce gloves they put on, they could put 18 on them. If he hit you right, you go to sleep. Now, as far as the betting on this fight, Tyson was like a two and a half to one underdog. Now it's less than two to one money pouring in on Iron Mike and specifically Iron Mike by knockout. How do you officially see the like exact result? Is it do you think Tyson outpoints him? Do you think he gets to him in the early rounds? I'm just going to say this and I'm going to end it like this. How many people did we see Mike Tyson outpoint in his heyday? Hmm. Not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. So if we depend it. on points, if it go to a point system, you may be going to give it to Jake because there's no way he might be out point nobody. Right. Well, that's, that's what I'm worried thing. about. He's the more marketable fighter for the boxing, yeah, and we'll get into that. Enough. But all right. All right. You made it clear. Now, listen, I love that you said Mike Tyson was on your boxing bucket list. What else do you have? Who else is on your boxing bucket list? Is there anyone else? Is there a YouTube personality like Mr. Beast or Dude Perfect? Couple of them are on my bucket list because like they're not high. People on your bucket list usually are higher than you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In that sport. Now that it's different with the YouTube thing, there's a lot of them that can go on my bucket list because there's a lot of them that you can generate a lot of money with. You know what I'm sure. saying? Mm -hmm. So they would be on my bucket list, they'll be on my pocket list. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> I like that yeah. better. Yeah, that works yeah. out. All right, listen, Roy, we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna be right back with the great Roy Jones Jr. Welcome back to Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend. We're here with boxing legend Roy Jones Jr., who boasts 66 career wins, 47 of those by knockout, and 39 of those were found to have defecated in their trunks during the match. Congratulations on that. I don't know if you knew that officially. Um, I will say, Roy, I feel like I was on the receiving end of one of those knockouts. One of my earliest memories of you was in 1994. They called it the Uncivil War. It was you and James Tony. IBF Super Middleweight Championship. My dad, who never bought a pay-per-view in his life, purchased this fight. I had some friends over. The parlay kid was there. And I'm ashamed to say, we all bet on James Tony, and you made us look foolish and made him look foolish. You won the fight. You won every round, I think, convincingly. Was this the turning point of your career? And also, can I borrow $250 in pay-per-view costs? <laughs> you can get $250 right here. Yeah. Um, that was actually the start, the, real, the true start of my career. Because yeah. with, with with me, I was a guy who always believed in the old ways and the things that the old people did, the way they lived, the way Ali lived, the way Joe Frazier lived, the way George Foreman lived, Larry Holm, Ernie Shavers. I felt like to be the man, you got to beat the man. And James Tony definitely was the man at the time. So I'm not holding nothing against nobody who thought that I didn't have a chance because James was a real bona fide champion. He was truthfully the pound for pound guy at that time. You can't mm -hmm. take nothing away from it. You understand me? So anybody who thought that he was going to beat me, they had way more than enough reason to think so. He's 44 and old. I'm like 26 or 27. Now. Right. Come on, mm -hmm. man. Who, who think you're going to beat Jane? And Jane's knocking out everybody from middleweight, super middleweight in the gym. He probably knocking out a lot of heavyweights too. So it's like he was that guy. So who who would think little Roy Jones Jr. from Pensacola, Florida, from where? Where's yeah. where that? You know, so it's like nobody would have thought that. Now, I can't blame people for that, but for me, it was good because that was the best way to take the world by storm. And not to mention, he talked an amazing game, too, right? So he had he that. Did that. Yeah, yeah. But he used to talk it and back it up. That was right. the bad part of it. I got gotcha. you. Now, one thing, interesting thing about your career, I always remember 1996, you competed in two sporting events in one day. Pro basketball, the USBL is a pro league, right? Jacksonville, mm -hmm. Barracudas. Yep. Barracudas, and yep. And then that night you fought a gentleman named Eric Lucas. Um, don't you think you should get more recognition as one of the great two sport athletes? We talk about Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders all the time. Where's Roy Michael Jones Jordan. Jr.? Michael Jordan. We don't say nothing about Roy Jones Jr. Nothing. No. Nothing. And I don't know, maybe they say because they wouldn't complete the NBA. So I don't know. But uh, it was two sporting professional sporting events the same day. It was a boxer who played basketball too. They don't never want to give you credit for it, but you know, it, it is what it is. You no, know, it's Roy Jones Jr. Roy Jones Jr. That's why I made sons that y'all must have forgot. Y'all forgot half over half the stuff that I did in this sport and in this game, you know. They forgot over half the things that I've done, wrapping my own self to the ring, putting out albums, got a song that's still that was made in 2004 that people are still using as workout music today. Yeah. 20 years later. Come on, bro. God has blessed me so abundantly that 
I don't care what people see. I know what God. I know what God did for me, so I'm cool with it. But now nah, they don't give me enough credit for it, and um, it's cool. I don't. I don't admit it. And let's mention this: the guy that I beat the night that I played that basketball game. Yeah, that guy went up after that to become the WBC Super Middleweight Champion and held that title for three years. He, he did, right? It. Yeah. But, and the but Jacksonville but Barracudas went on to win the NBA title. No, 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 that's okay. No, I know what you're saying. Hey, listen, <laughs> I think you should get the respect. I'm going to look into this. I think there should be a two-sport Hall of Fame, and I think you're a first ballot guy right there. I'm going to get Roy should Jones be. Jr. in. There you go. Should be. Um, I know you're a football fan. I saw on your Instagram page that you're a Steelers fan, and you even mm-hmm. talked to the team this preseason. What did you say to them? Because they're 7-2. and two. They weren't supposed to be this good, and they are. We are the Steelers. We got to come here with that undefeated idea on our mind every day because most people are just people. But when you fight a champion or you fight a, a legend, then you go at him a different way. Pittsburgh Steelers one of the oldest, most winningest organizations in the NFL football. When they come to play the Pittsburgh Steelers, everybody bring in the A game. So when y'all come to practice every day, come to practice with A game and mentality because if you don't have A game mentality, you already lost come Sunday because everybody that pays the Pittsburgh Steelers are coming to beat one of the winningest franchises ever in the NFL. I love it. And that's all it took. Could you please come talk to my Dallas Cowboys and fix them? Or is that hopeless? Do you need to bring that's somebody hopeless. else in for that? That's hopeless because you got to talk to Jerry Jones. Oh. And that's going to be a little bit more difficult. He is a Jones, so I might be able to talk to him a little bit. I don't know, but that's a little different. <laughs> Can you look into this? Maybe you're related to Jerry Jones, Roy Jones, and maybe you have a, a piece of this team coming to you. And yes, then you would have more say in their decisions. Well, let me tell you like this too, though. This, this is ironic. And I hope he's listening because Sean Payton still owes me a ring. The early the season the New York New Orleans Saints won the NFL championship. I gave them a speech right before the season started, before I fought Jeff Lacey. They took that speech and went on and won their first franchise ever NFL Super Bowl ring. You understand me? And he didn't give me one. This is crazy. How you do that? Two sport Hall of Fame, your ode, and a Super Bowl ring. I'm making a list here for you, Roy. This is ridiculous. You wouldn't believe it. Who is your midseason Super Bowl pick at this point? Um, you know, I'm gonna tell you the truth. The team that I think is definitely gonna probably make it to the Super Bowl this year if they keep playing the way they're playing is the Detroit Lions. The Detroit yeah. Lions are playing lights out football right now. You hear me? And of course, Patrick Mahomes, because you know, I, I pick I'm picking Patrick Mahomes to win it because as bad as they're playing right now, they're still hating no. So that being said, it's going to be hard to see because, you know, you the team try to come and beat at the end of the season. You don't see teams start down here. Right. And I was saying go there, right? This team is down here, but they're still up here. <laughs> yeah, but you're even right. Down here is above everybody else. But they're down here, and they still the only undefeated team. <laughs> down here right now. What's going to happen when they start playing up here? It's wild. You're right. You talk about that second gear. We know they have it's it. They have like five and six gears. You know, as you were going through this, I was trying to figure out who Patrick Mahomes reminds me of as a boxer. And it, it might be like a Julio Cesar Chavez, who even on 19 yeah, didn't Jones. look like he had it. He yeah, Roy Jones Jr. because so. he, oh, it's he you. kind of got it. He kind of got it. You don't know where it might come from. Oh. You understand? Know He's unpredictable. He might, you don't know what he might do. Right. You know what I mean? And it's like, Julio sees the shot, man. We knew what Julio was going to do. Julio gotcha. was going to come in there. He's going to take that body. He's going to destroy you with that left hook. We already know that. We don't know what Patrick Mahomes might do. One mm-hmm. game he may beat up with his arm. One game he may beat up with his legs. One game he may, may beat up with his brain. We don't know. He went in now, not with his arm, not with his legs, but with his brain. Well, he had a horrible games, but he's still winning. Right. Wow. You and you know what? Yeah, and also like the great Roy Jones Jr., Patrick Mahomes, two sport athlete, right? See? Baseball, shortstop. Yeah, See? you're right. It was right there for me. I should have grabbed it. You're right. All right, exactly. Roy. Roy, before we let you go, I've got one last question for you. We call this Cousins Conundrum. Cousins Conundrum. All right, dig mm-hmm. in here. Okay. You have to fight Jake Paul and his brother Logan Paul at the same time. If you win. We never have to hear from the Pauls again. And as a result, you receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom for your service to humanity. But if you lose, you have to get that Mike Tyson face tattoo. 
Are you taking the deal? I'm taking the deal. Yes. I love it. I love it. Tell me why. Do you like the, the tattoo or you're just confident in your boxing abilities? I'm, I'm taking the deal because I feel like, I mean, we got to really worry about it. Jake has a bigger punch. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one can fight him, but he don't have a big punch. So as long as you don't get caught by Jake's big punch, fight should be easy. Right. So what do you, you just what go I right do. after Logan? You go right after Logan? Say, hey, right you got to take my best. Right away. Right after. Get him out of there quick. Yeah. I like it. I like this. <laughs> what a tremendous guest you are. Roy Jones Thank Jr. You, two sport hall of fame. We're going to get him in there. You can catch him as part of the all the smoke team. And this Friday's telecast right there. He's going to be calling it as an analyst. Netflix fight. Paul versus Tyson. Thanks for coming on, Roy. I appreciate it. Thank you. God bless everybody. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back to break down week 11 with the parlay kid next on cousin Sal's winning weekend. Welcome back to Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend. You know, they say misery loves company. And because my therapist still refuses to give out NFL picks, we've got the next best thing. My Cowboys companion, my Dallas defendant from the Against All Odds podcast, Darren the Parlay Kid. What's up, buddy? What's going on, Sal? Thanks for having me again. Of course. You know, Darren, we just talked to the great Roy Jones Jr. He discussed how the fight against James Toney put him on the boxing map and how it really put us on the gambling misery map. Maybe it happened (laughs) before that, but do you remember that? We watched that fight at my father's house. My father got the pay-per-views very, very stingy with the pay-per-views, but he got that. We were all excited and we had James Tony and boy, did we pay. Yeah. The golden age of uh, boxing for us in terms of especially wagering when we were doing a lot at that time. I mean, not like the way we're wagering now in terms of amount of money, but no. for young kids, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, a couple hundred bucks. And yes, uh, to our apologies to uh, our pal Roy Jones Jr. for betting against him. But we thought that James Tony sitting at minus 120 in that fight crazy seemed like a steal at the time for some reason, even though both fighters were undefeated. Yeah. It was something very menacing about James Tony. That, and he was a little bit more brash than Roy Jones at that time. And we just thought that he would handle business. We thought we were getting a steal at minus 120. We were young and dumb at that time, Sal. Yes. Young now and we're, dumb. Now we're old and dumb. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think he lost every round. It was disgraceful. But every I apologize. Round. James Tony says, uh, well, actually, Roy Jones says he's going to give us the $250 back that we lost. So oh, I'll yeah, that's about, I think that's about what it was. We, that was like was. a big wager for yeah, us at that exactly. time. Exactly. All a right. Big one. I'll split it with you. But let's make some money on our own here. Week 11. Here's the Sunday slate. We're going to start with the Jaguars at the Lions. Mac Jones is in a quarterback for an injured Trevor Lawrence who is out with a shoulder sprain. This line is Detroit 13 and a half, 46 and a half. It seems like it's going to be a demolition, right? The Lions, you know, any which way you take them. Passing game, they beat you. Running game, they just get great speed from their running backs, right? Special team scores for them. They win in the rain. They won last week, a game they had no business winning against the Texans. Um, 13 and a half may not be enough against the Mac Jones-led Jags, who's dead to rights, but... I'm going to take a player prop, and that's Jared Goff, over 230 and a half, Parlay Kid. He was in the MVP discussion, and then he threw like five picks, and that takes you right out of the discussion. Um, now it's time to show back off again. He's hit this number over 230 and a half in 11 of his last 13 home games. He averages 260 over that span. Drake May went for 270 plus against this Jacksonville defense. Flacco went for almost 360 against the 30th ranked pass defense. Give me Goff in a bounce back game to go over 230 and a half. What do you like? Well, I think you like mine then too, Sal. I'm going to be taking the Lions over three and a half touchdowns at minus 128. For them to cover that number, uh, they're going to have to score about four touchdowns yeah. minimum here. They average 31 and a half points per game. The Jaguars have the 27th ranked scoring defense. Goff's not going to have two clunkers in a row here, Sal. Uh, I'm thinking the Lions find their offensive groove in this one, and they roll, and they roll big. All right. And, you know, you get a special teams touchdown. That counts in your favor, Something obviously. Something like that. So exactly that's good. correct. All right. Green Bay, Chicago. Packers on the road. Soldier Field. Five and a half point favorite. Forty and a half is the over under. Let's get to the teasers. Packers in the over. That's what I'm doing. I think I have a couple <laughs> this week. And we're going to start with the oldest and greatest rivalry in the NFL, which coincidentally hasn't produced one memorable game. In the exactly. last 50 years. How is this the greatest rivalry, Polly Kid? What's a big game? Like, I think they were in the 
NFC Championship, and it was like Caleb Hayne. It was somebody great. It wasn't even a game. I don't know what happened there. But yes. uh, disgusting. I think that Hail Mary spooked the Bears, and now they're a mess. The coach seems to have lost the locker room. The quarterback won't even be picked up by his players after a sack. He went down nine times last week, Caleb Williams. Chicago had lost 10 in a row to the Packers. No reason to think it won't be 11. Better coach, better quarterback, better everything off a of bye. Seven of the last eight have gone over yeah. this 34 and a half number between these two teams. So I'm going to take the teaser. I think the Packers win somewhere around 24 16, but I'm not going to screw with the actual numbers. This is a good teaser. That's my pick, Green Bay in the over. What do you have? I love that teaser, Sal, and I love that final score. I'm a winner here if that's the score. I'm taking the Packers and Bears, both teams to score 15 plus points oh. at minus 118. So good weather here. Yeah. Uh, in this game, which can be rare at this time of the year. I'm betting on a Caleb Williams bounce back week somehow or another, right? This season's not over yet for the Bears. They have to find their offensive game. And so I'm asking for 15 points. That's all. <laughs> That's all. A two scores, two touchdowns, and a field goal, and I'm going to win this thing. Rams and Patriots. This is a Super Bowl rematch. Wow. Um, you know, listen, I'm happy for all the Patriots fans because they're happy with their new quarterback, but I'm not sure he should be compared to Joe Montana just yet, but I am happy for them. Great road mm. win versus the Bears. The defense was a story. I mentioned nine sacks, but... I don't think they'll be competitive every week, and I'm taking the Rams adjusted to pump the brakes here. I'll pump them myself for this Super Bowl rematch. Like I said, Rams minus 9.5 adjusted is plus 172 now. New England still have four games where they lost by 17-plus points, right? As good as you, Drake May is and everything else, I think this is just the time that Sean McVay steps up. I feel like they've been let for dead, Parlor Kid, yeah. after that listless performance against the Dolphins. And McVay's going to be like, hey, remember me? He's the best on short rest, 10-1 and one against the spread in his last 11 with the rest advantage, uh, or disadvantage, rather. I like the uh, defense to be in Drake May's face for most of the afternoon, and the Ram speedsters at wide out to break a couple of long ones. Super Bowl L-I-I-I, this final 27-13. Give me the Rams. Yeah, I like what you're saying here. So if you win, I win. I'm just taking them at minus four and a half. Mm -hmm. Sure, the Pats are coming off a super impressive win against the Bears. That seemed like a right, the good, a good matchup for the Patriots uh, in that one. Do I always love this? You know, uh, West Coast to East Coast, 1 p.m. start. No, but guess what? Like you said, uh, and especially on a short week. But McVeigh is the the guy who always really comes through in these situations. Yep. And you know we I'm a big McVay fan. Look, the Rams don't have any excuses here. They have all their weapons available to them. They This is a must-win game for the Rams. If they lose this, they can probably kiss their playoff hopes goodbye. They need it. The Patriots don't. Let's take the Rams minus four and a half. No doubt. I just want Drake May to play well and they lose by 40, right? I should be good. And Simmons, you know, he'll, he'll be over the moon on the <laughs> podcast. It won't make any sense, but we'll go on from there. All right. New Orleans, one and a half point favorite, 44 and a half versus Cleveland. It's in New Orleans. <laughs> we're both taking the Browns. I don't know why we're doing this. I, I do. I do know why we're doing this, but, um, Listen, relying on the Saints has also proven to be a foolish uh, way to go about things. I do like the new coach there, Parley Kid, Rizzy, the clogger, as we've called him. I need to know ahead of time if he's going to clog the toilet in the morning because that could really swing the line uh, against us. But I'm going to take Cleveland off the bye here. Stefanski 3-1 and one after a week off. Saints 1-5 and five against the spread in their last six games. I probably just should have grabbed a player prop because I think it's going to be low scoring and it's going to be one in the fourth quarter. But I feel like Ford and Chubb are going to put together nice offensive games on the ground. And I guess I'm betting against Derek Carr to have back-to-back -back solid games. Maybe see a little spark out of Jameis. I don't, I don't love this one, but I'm going to go 21-17 Browns. What do you like? Yeah, Coach uh, Coach Rizzi and our pal Harry have a lot in common. And so <laughs> we, we, what we have in common is taking the Browns together. And guess what? That is spelled doom for us this year. But we're back right. at it. Taking yeah. the Browns plus one and a half points. Dare I say this is a revenge game for Jameis Winston? I don't know. I, yeah. guess, I guess you could look at it in that respect, too. Uh, but look, the, the, the Saints were lucky to pull off that win last week. Uh, against the Falcons stopping their seven-game skid when the Falcons really statistically thoroughly outplayed them. I think they got their win 
They're not going anywhere, Sal. Either of the Browns, but I do think the Browns still have a pretty good defense. On an, any given day, that defense can dominate, especially when the Saints just don't have that many weapons on offense. Let's take the Browns getting that point now. Yeah, like you said, they're kind of middle of the pack this year, the Browns defense, but I could see Carr going down about five or six times. This could be the game. All right, exactly. Minnesota at Tennessee. The Vikings are a five-and-a-half point favorite. I watched that Vikings offense last week. Not great. I think they've come back down to earth a little bit. Right. Sam Darnold, three interceptions. Still a playoff team, but less and less impressive, at least the offenses with their wins. Brian Flores, on the other hand, defensively, they've stepped it up. They've allowed 20 combined points over the last two games. And Titans, Titans haven't broken 20 points in five weeks. So you can't really be excited about that Will Levis offense. Almost zero big play capability there. The under has come in on nine of the last 12 games. That's my pick, by the way. I should have mentioned under 39 and a half. And it's come in nine of the last 12 games where the Vikings are favored. 22-14-ish, I'm going under. What do you like? Yeah, so you talk about both offenses, uh, not necessarily sputtering for the Vikings, but not flourishing like it did hmm. uh, just a few weeks ago. So, so I'm going to take both teams to not complete their first pass attempt wow. at minus 118. So that's a no on both teams to complete their first pass attempt. Quite simply, I just don't trust a Sam Darnold who has struggled in his last few games, like you said, through three interceptions last game, and Will Levis to both complete their first pass against good pass defenses. Let's hope I hit this one right away. Incomplete pass. I'm a winner. Mm. Let's uh, stay away from the game here for me. Miami, a seven-point favorite, 44-and-a-half against Vegas. Uh, I'm not buying back in on the Dolphins just yet. It was a pretty impressive win. Yeah. Monday, too, have played a little more reckless fashion than I thought. Now on a short week against the Raiders, who are coming off a bye. I don't even have to tell you how masterful Antonio Pierce is yeah. after a bye. I mean, he that guy is the best. <laughs> no, they can't be trusted either. So I'm going to go with a boring player prop. That's Jacoby Myers, under 50 and a half receiving yards. Not that the player is boring, but his stats have become a little ho-hum. He's gone under 51 in five of his last six against top 10 defenses, averaging 41 yards over that stretch. Dolphins, um, sorry, Dolphins boast a top eight pass defense. Give me under 50 and a half for Jacoby and Myers. It's about time we cash on this. Ignore both teams who have been proven to be untrustworthy. What do you like? We're going to be taking a six-point teaser here, Sal. So taking the Dolphins at minus one here for the game and under 50 and a half kind of plays into what you are saying. Somehow or another, the Dolphins, I guess, are kind of back in a, the playoff mix uh, and they obviously need this game to stay in it. So I'm just, I just need them to win this game uh, on that part of the teaser for the most part. Uh, the Raiders are 25th in the league in points per game uh, averaging under 19 and the Finns are 30th averaging about 16 points a game. Although that's a bit skewed obviously because they are better with Tua, but Sal, even with Tua, this Dolphins offense just has not clicked like it did the first half of last year. Yeah. So that's where we're going to get this under from. The Dolphins would have to carry this off this game offensively for this to go over 50 and a half. I just don't see both teams uh, flourishing offensively. So let's take the Dolphins here, minus one and the under. 50 and a half. I'm looking at the remaining schedule. They do they have some cupcakes in there, but they have the they're at the Packers, they're also at the Texans, and they host the 49ers. So they would yeah, have it's to a probably win shot, two but... of those three at least, right? Uh all yep. right, here's a good one. Baltimore and Pittsburgh. Ravens three point favorite, 48 and a half. I'm taking Baltimore, and I know these games have been pretty tight, Parley Kid, over the last four mm -hmm. or five years, but yep. uh, I made the statement that I think this is where the Ravens and 49ers pull away in their divisions. Um, 49ers have a little more work to do, um, uh, distancing themselves from the second place team, but Baltimore's offense is going to be too much, I think. Uh, it's whether they can hold on or not. That defense, the games have gone over in six yep. straight between these two. Just a gut feeling that Baltimore, that number one ranked, Offense is going to take over. Sorry, look at uh, babyface Joel Solomon's making all sorts of noises over there. This big Steelers <laughs> fan. I think Lamar scores a bunch. They hold on. Ravens hold on. Defensively, 28-20 final. Give me Baltimore minus three. What do you like? Yeah, I'm going to take the Ravens and Pittsburgh, both teams, to not score in the first quarter. So one of those teams cannot score mm -hmm. uh, in the first quarter at minus 136. 
Look, for as good as the Ravens' offense has, has been, in three out of their last four, they haven't even scored a first quarter point. Yeah. So I'm rolling the dice, and I don't think it's going to be the Ravens here. I think it's going to be the Steelers. So this is a divisional game, obviously, that always plays close. Both teams are well versed in what each other do. So, like a prize fight, speaking with, we had Roy Jones over uh, on, uh, they will feel each other out early before they really start landing some offensive blows. So, let's take one of these teams to not score in the first quarter at minus 136. All right. One more game for the early afternoon. That's the Jets, a three and a half point favorite over the Colts. This is another one I'm just going to close my eyes and make a pick. Actually, I'm not even going to go aside. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go with the over 43 and a half. I mean, yeah. You know, this is a pathetic Jets bunch up against Anthony Richardson, who's now back starting for the Colts. That's a net zero for me in terms of analysis. Joe Flacco certainly seemed to have lost his swagger, so I understand the change, yeah. but it's tough to lay points with the Jets. I'm going over. Aaron Rodgers is a failure as a human being and a professional football player. So, But in that context, I think it's the Jets' defense that has been just as much mm. of a problem. 25th against the run, so I could see a big Jonathan Taylor game. And Parley Kidd, they forced one turnover, and they're 29th in the league versus the pass since Robert Sala was canned. Richardson, we know he likes to throw long, right? He takes his chances. I'll give him credit there. These teams play high-scoring games. The over is 5-1 and one in the Colts' last six games at MetLife Stadium. 26-22 final. Who covers, who wins? I don't really care. I'm going over. What do you like? Yeah, I'm going to take the Colts plus the three and a half. Sal pal, Anthony Richardson, back in the starters role. He said all the right things leading up to this. Been taking a lot of notes. I think he has a pretty solid game here. And if not with his arm, he's going to make some plays with his legs. And he's got a red hot Jonathan Taylor to take some pressure off him too. I think the Colts will pound the ball. Richardson, as you said, will go up top a few times in this game. They're going to cover this three and a half, Sal. All right. Yeah, you're right. The Jets defense doesn't look like they want to hit. Maybe because of flag football is becoming an Olympic sport. Maybe they it's, have their sights focused true, there. True. All right, listen, we have to take a break. Lots more with the Parlay Kid, including a big AFC showdown as the undefeated Chiefs head to Buffalo to take on the mm. Bills. And sure, I guess we'll talk about the Cowboys and Texans on Monday night. But I promise I'm not going to enjoy it. All next, Cousin Sal's winning weekend. All right, welcome back to Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend here with the pride of Elwood, New York, Darren Sicoli. Darren, congratulations. You won Suffolk County Coach of the Year. We have a picture of it right here. There it is. You're there yeah. with uh, – tell us what's going on here. One of the girls is holding her um, her plaque upside down, but I, I don't know if that's by design. <laughs> what's what's happening there? Well, look, that's uh, – I coach an absolutely wonderful group of uh, girls cross-country runners, and – the girl directly to uh, my left uh, is my niece, uh, brother Bry's daughter, uh, Cameron. I love it. Uh, and that's uh, her two friends, uh, Ava and Sloan. Uh, Sloan is a little eighth grader there. Uh, for us, who we were representing us this weekend in the New York State Championship. So wow. had a lot of fun. So, you know, 30 uh, plus years of coaching football. I had a chance to make a career change. And it's been absolutely wonderful coaching uh Girls cross country. Who would have figured, Sal? Uh, this is Friday night. Li this is a little bit of Friday night lights here. I'm feeling. I think you, you know. Maybe we can. Maybe we can get a series going. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> All right, go Cameron. Go girls. All right, That's let's awesome. get back to our picks and the late afternoon games. A good one in the NFC West: Seahawks at 49ers. Christian McCaffrey returned last week. Um, I thought San Francisco would launch into we're not effing around mode last week. Not entirely impressive. A three-point win against Tampa, but they did miss three field goals, so maybe it didn't have to be close. But I'm taking this week them uh, laying the points, six and a half. They won this game in Seattle by 12 a month ago. They beat them up that game. They forced Geno to throw two interceptions. Now they're off the bye. They're not the team they used to be, the Seattle team. Not the Legion of Boom. Not even from a couple years ago, uh, the defensive team that when Geno made the run for Seattle. They're 25th defensive overall. This is where 49ers and Brock Purdy put their foot in the turf and make a statement. They say this is our division. Everyone back off and watch CMC light up the scoreboard. 49ers 5-1 and one against the spread in the last six against Seattle, and they won all six of those, much of the same on Sunday. 31-16 final. Give me San Francisco. What do you like? You're going to be taking Purdy under 262.5 passing yards at minus 114. Purdy threw for about 350 last week against Tampa, but prior to that had gone under this number in four straight 
So quite simply, there's a lot of rain in the forecast. Hmm. I think 49ers will be turning to their ground game to pull this one out. Take the under 262 and a half before this guts even lower. All right, I like that. Denver, a two and a half point favorite at home against Atlanta. 44 and a half is the total. This is the Dan Reeves Bowl. Dan Re- did Dan Reeves make a Super Bowl uh, with both teams? He did, right? Atlanta yes, he and did. Denver? That's right. All Correct. Right. Denver is, uh, no one cares. But Denver's stuck on five victories for a bit, a few weeks now. They're looking to go over their preseason five and a half win projection. Atlanta running away with a division where all the other teams have run away from the division. Uh, actually, only a two game lead, but it seems much worse. Uh, I'm running away from a side, and I'm taking a player prop. Kirk Cousins, scary game against Tampa, over 500 yards like a month ago, but pretty pedestrian yardage-wise games, uh, passing-wise. The rest of the way, he doesn't hasn't passed him. It's the Bijan show, basically, if you look at it. He's had under Cousins 33 pass attempts in six of the last seven games. The Broncos have a top five overall defense, top 10 pass defense. They allow 192 yards a game, so I'm going to go Cousins under 239 and a half passing yards. Kirko, yes, I like that. What are you going with? So I'm going to be taking Denver minus two and a half, but I have to say, out of all the games, I find this one to be maybe the toughest Very tough. one on the slate this week. Uh, did Denver have their win taken out of their sails with that loss to the Chiefs? Or did they find some confidence in, in themselves saying, hey, we can play with the best. I'm going to go with the latter there, Sal, saying that they feel like they can play with anybody in the league now especially because their D is so good. I think that D gives Cousins plenty of fits during this game, and they eke this one out by a field goal or maybe a little bit more. Take Denver minus the two and a half. All right. Here's a good one. Buffalo and Kansas. It's actually good matchups this week, right? Seattle, San Francisco, Buffalo, Kansas City, Baltimore, Pittsburgh would be good. Buffalo has gone up to a two and a half point favorite over the Chiefs. Oh, what are the odds makers doing? 46 and a half is the over under. We keep waiting for Kansas City to screw up and they come close and close and close and it doesn't happen. I would think this is a tough spot at the Bills, but Buffalo kind of going through the motions. Not a must win. They have a four and a half game lead mm-hmm. in the AFC East, but of course they want to get the playoff monkey off their back. I'm splitting the dif- difference here, Paul. Can I'm taking the Chiefs on a teaser plus eight and a half and over 40 and a half. All 10 Bills games have gone over 40 points combined this year. And I don't even have to go back and tell you when the last time the Chiefs lost by nine or more. I actually did look. It was 19 games ago. So I'm going to peg this at 24-20 Bills, but I like where the six-point teaser leaves me in this one. What do you like? That's a good one too, Sal. I'm taking Allen anytime touchdown at plus 140. Is it wagering suicide to bet against the Chiefs as a dog? I guess the stats would say so, even though this week I will be going with the Bills. I just think it's their time. I think they're pumped to make a message here. And the Chiefs are due for a loss, no matter what our pal Harry says. Mm. Um, Look, look, Allen is always best in these type of moments. He hasn't used his legs as much uh, this year. But last week, eight rushes for 50 yards and a touchdown. He's only scored four rushing touchdowns this year after having 15 last year. I think he takes to the ground a little bit more often, trying to will his team to victory. Let's take Allen at plus 140 for an anytime touchdown. All right, another good matchup, which I didn't mention earlier, the Chargers and the Bengals. This, I think, was flexed to Sunday night, right? I'm pretty sure it was Colts-Jets, and now it's Chargers-Bengals. A battle for, like, the six or seven seed in the AFC, somewhere in there, I would say. Chargers have now won three games in a row that they were supposed to, which is ridiculous for that franchise. The Bengals are a scary team, probably one of the last you want to play in January, but they just can't get over the hump. I don't have a strong opinion on the side. I could see a number of things happening. I'm going to go with a player prop, Quentin Johnston, out of TCU, highly touted last year, right? Then couldn't catch a pass. They were talking about cutting him. And now look at this, five touchdowns in the last six games. I think he's going to score at plus 235. He has the most touchdowns on the team. You could get him long or it could beat you deep. Herbert's comfortable with him, and I'm comfortable laying some loot on the prop that pays 235. What do you have? Well, Sal, I I think, like you said, this is a big matchup for both teams, but if the Chargers win this, they're basically going to solidify themselves a playoff spot. So I think Cincy, as the more desperate team, I'll take Mm. them getting the point and a half. This is basically offense versus defense. Even though the Chargers' offense has done enough, uh, really, it's the defense, their number one ranked defense that has carried them. But I'm betting that the Cincy offense, especially now with this Chase Brown, 
giving them some balance at that running back position. We'll have a little too much offense for the Chargers in this game to keep up. Let's take Cincy getting that point and a half. All right, Parley kid. We'll save the worst for last. Houston at Dallas, seven and a half point favor. This is a Monday night game, 41 and a half. I don't even know why it's seven and a half. Everybody kills us, right? I mean, we're forever <laughs> linked to this demoralized Dallas franchise. I hit this in Wager Razor earlier in the show. I said Houston laying two plus touchdowns. I think yeah. we have a fair amount of blowouts left on our schedule. I'm going to take a different bet here. Same narrative, Texans over 24 and a half points. They've allowed the Cowboys 138 points in four games. That's almost 35 a game. At home, they've allowed 153 in four games. That's almost 39 a game. I'm not even going to blame the defense totally. I'm going to blame the sun. No, the offense can't move the ball and lots of three and outs and Cooper Rush or Trey Lance yeah. puts them in a bad position defensively. I think we see an explosive game out of Stroud. He has to be pissed. He didn't put Detroit away when he could have. Little brother, big, big brother thing in Texas. Um, I don't even know if the Cowboys could play with pride anymore. 30 to 10 final Texans. You have a similar bet here. Well, then you like this. Sal. This would barely hit for me. The Texans win margin. 11 to 20 points, plus 290. The Texans will be up for this game against their in-state rival. Uh, I think they'll have probably more fans than the Cowboys uh, will have there. They'll be buying those tickets up very fast. Uh, and look, especially after suffering that terrible loss they had last week. So I think they're going to bounce back. And so don't forget, Nico Collins looks like he's back for yeah. the Texans. That's going to present the Cowboys problems. Of course, he's back against the Cowboys. Yeah. Always seems to work out that way. Cowboys D, as you said, has been getting torched all year, especially at home, Sal. I can't figure it out where we were so dominant. Now we can't win a game at home. We're giving up like 35 points a game there. And offensively, Cooper Rush just cannot get it done. I, I don't know how they won games with him years ago. Yeah, He looks like he can't even throw a, 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 a ball more than 20, 30 yards at this point. Texans roll. Let's take the win margin, 11 to 20 points. All right, Darren. That was painful. Not, not your assessment, just going through that game, me and you. But we have sure. to do it. We're going to do it again also on Against All Odds Monday night right after the game. Great job. Hopefully you win big this weekend. Hey, maybe you can sign Juan Soto to the Rec League softball team, right? <laughs> Thanks again, pal. We're going to be right back to wrap things up on Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend. All right, welcome back to Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend. Hey, we're all out of time. My thanks to Roy Jones Jr. for all the insight on the Tyson-Paul fight. Sean Payton, if you're listening, let's figure out how to get Roy the Super Bowl ring he so rightly deserves. And thanks to Darren the Parlay Kid for handing out all those Week 11 winners, and even if they aren't, thanks anyway. And most importantly, thanks to all of you for watching and listening. And please, always remember, you may feel like an underdog, but just know you're all my favorites. Happy handicapping!